The last poem we're going to consider in chapter two is a, is a poem called A Recollection by John Peel Bishop. And here it is. Uh, is it a, what's the form of the poem? Anybody recognize this form? It's a traditional form. It's a Petrarchan sonnet. It's a sonnet. There are two kinds of sonnet. There's the Shakespearean sonnet, which ends in a couplet, and then there's the Petrarchan, which has more of an interlocking rhyme scheme. Is it a perfect Petrarchan sonnet? No. Why isn't it perfect? Uh, the rhyme. I'm not. Hold on. I'm not entirely sure about the rhyme scheme. Maybe someone else can help me out. I think it is perfect. It? Yeah. Hair perfect. caught, taught air. A B B A. Were, ought, thought, there. Okay. A B B A. Yeah. Cloud yes. ease proud. Sees could bees. Okay. It's it perfectly perfect. rhymed and perfectly rhythm rhythmic metric. Although I guess normally it would be like in an octave and a sestet, right? Like yes, that's yeah. right. The stanzas are a little different. Are a little Let different. me read the first couple lines and you tell me what the tone is and the diction. Famously, she descended her red hair, unbound and bronzed by sea reflections, caught crinkled with sea pearls, the fine slender taut knees that let down, it's a nude descending a staircase almost, although she's not nude. The fine slender taut knees that let down her feet upon the air, young breasts, slim flanks, and golden quarries were odder than, what's the tone? Or what's the diction? It's very high poetic diction. High poetic diction, fancy words, overstatement, floweriness. Wait a minute, guys, what's this doing here? What's this doing here? This isn't a modern poem. What's going on? It seems like a satire. It's mocking it because it's going so over the top with its loftiness. Give me some, other than what I've read, give me an example of a phrase that seems to be deliberately over the top. Golden quarries? What? What is a golden quarry? I don't think I Yeah, it's know. sort of gloopy. It's this very thing that the imagists hated. And it made them want to do free verse, but this isn't free verse. This is a traditional sonnet. And the setting, art historian? Uh, well, we have Venice, which is traditionally a kind of high seat of Renaissance painting. And you have the reference to the Barberini, who are a wealthy Italian family who commissioned a lot of art. And we have essentially a Botticellian woman figure mm -hmm. there. So it's, it's, it's an Italian sonnet set in Italy in a Renaissance mode in, in a in renaissance a form in a renaissance form so why so maybe this is this got into our course by mistake we have to find are there are two ways to be modern in, in, with respect to form one is to abandon form right to do what williams did sometimes right to abandon form to embrace free, free verse and to find your own form but there's another way to do it and that is to ironize or satirize form Right? And that's a common strategy. So how, so we must find evidence in the poem. We must find evidence that it is ironizing the traditional form. We must look, and you must look, and you'll never pass on to chapter three unless you figure out, you're looking at words on a page, and you're, Allie, do you see it yet? Um... Look, you have to look on the page for evidence that John Peel Bishop is saying, I'm not, I don't believe what I'm saying, that I would never use such a tone, that we are in the modern era, that difference has spread. Does anybody see? You have to look hard. You have to be, the implicit instruction from Stein is to think as if you're learning the language again from the start. What is the first thing they teach you about language? The alphabet. The alphabet. Don't think by the phrase. Don't think by the word. Think by the letter. It, look hard. If you see it, raise your hand. If you see the challenge, if you see the satire, if you see the mock, if you see the modernism, you're, you're trying to look, you're trying to think. Remember, modernism is about thinking about how language gets constituted. Think, it's thinking about how we read. It's back to basics. All right? So, if you, if you're, look, look at it, look at it. Words are words. They're not thoughts or beautiful things. They're words. We must find in every poem, we must think about every poem. How is this poem saying, saying, am I art? Am I conscious of my form? We have to look. Does anybody, has anybody seen 
a way of reading this against the grain. Anybody see it? Molly, do you see something? You have to look. We have to learn to look. We have to learn to read as if we're starting it over again. Emily doesn't have it. So Dave was hinting at looking at, but you're not saying that we should do what Dave was hinting at, looking at all the kind of satirical oh my God. over the topness. Okay. You've seen something? I'm sorry, Anna. You've seen something? Don't tell us what it is. Okay. You've seen it? Is it embarrassing? Uh, yeah. It is embarrassing. <laughs> it's so simple. You know, oh. I do this. I can do this poems. <laughs> Molly's got it. I can do this poem for fourth graders. And the fourth graders will get it right away, although it's <laughs> kind of not fair to the fourth graders. What were you going to say, Anna? Uh, do you I, see it? I <laughs> We have to, modernism makes us think, Gertrude Stein makes us think, how is language organized? How is it deployed to make the meaning that it does? John Peel Bishop, there's got to be some evidence that he is providing an alternative to the form. He's, he's got to ironize traditional form. Dave? I got it. You got it? Do you feel superior? <laughs> Can you give us a hint as to what it teaches us? Uh, I think it's the same thing as reading it as a satire, making fun of the whole tradition. I, think uh, I don't know if that's enough of a hint, Amaris. Are you still not there yet? No, I did. I was looking at the alliteration. I was wondering why there's such an excess of alliteration. And uh, All loveliness demands our courtesy. Since she was dead, I praised her as I could silently among the Barberini bees. I mean, what a loaded piece of love crap this is. <laughs> But that's not it. It's got to be, it's, it's got to teach us how to read. Emily Harnett, it's got to teach oh. us how to read. Look, look, oh. what do you see? I see, I see words. On see the, the words. Page. See the words as words. See the words as letters. How have we been naturalized to read? We've been naturalized to read how, Molly? From left to Sorry. right. <laughs> We've been it. naturalized to read left to right and also across. We need to read as if we're looking at the language for the first time. Did you see it? Mm -hmm. Amaris, you found it. We've all found it. It's so simple. I'm not even sure if we should say it. <laughs> you made us do this much work, we should say it. Go ahead and say it. Well, why do I have to? Because you are mostly not a person who uses, uses obscenities. <laughs> Fuck you, half-ass. <laughs> F-U-C-K-Y-O-U-H-A-L-F-A-S-S. -S -S. Down the side. It's kind of a trick. It's not really modernism at extremes. Not like Zara or the Baroness. But it gives us something important, which is that we should never again read naturally. We should try to read as unnaturally as we possibly can. We need to read every which way. We need to read as if every naturalized, standard-looking sonnet is actually a concrete poem. We need to think about how language is deployed as paint on a canvas. We need to think about how language gets constantly ironized by many different ways of reading it. And so John Peel Bishop is saying to the sonnet tradition that elevates the, port the importraited woman, the woman who's in the portrait here, the traditional sentiments of love, the way in which a sonnet can be so conventional and cliched that it no longer thinks of love. One way is to say it with bolts, and the other way is to say, fuck you half-ass to anyone who would write a standard sonnet in the 20th century to express their feelings of love.